So I'm going to start by saying a few words about Interact because it's new. A lot of you won't have heard of us before. Um, Interact basically is, is part of the, the Made Smarter family. Now, Made Smarter is a, a government investment program um, of work. £147 million pounds has been put into Made Smarter. And it's all about helping build a strong manufacturing um, sector that's enabled by digital technologies. Um, so there's lots of exciting things going on within Made Smarter. But in 2021, um, UKRI and um, ES ESRC um, in particularly recognised that a lot of the challenges around digital and manufacturing aren't about technology at all. They're actually about people, human beings and about behaviour. So they thought it would be useful to bring into the, the Made Smarter fold some thinking, some experiences, some knowledge, people that understand the economic and social sciences. So this was kind of summer 2021 and um, Jan and I became co-directors of what was then called the Made Smarter um, Network Plus, which we've now rebranded as Interact. Um, but the idea was that Jan and I spent a lot of our summer last year. Um, a lot of our summer last year. There's a bit of feedback there. Will do you think you could mute people? Thanks very much. Um, so last summer, Jan and I spent a lot of our time going out to try to understand what the gaps in understanding are. So we spoke to manufacturers about what they felt they needed. We spoke to policymakers about where they saw the gaps, and we also spoke to a lot of academics and a lot of um, a lot of uh, bodies that represented economic and social science academics about what they felt they had to bring to the party. So after we had done that, that put us in a position where we were able to put in a proposal, which was then funded for this Network Plus. So our funding came through in November, um, just before Christmas, and the network is funded to the tune of just under £4 million. It's um, part of the Made Smarter family, and it runs until December 24. So Jan and I are the, the co-directors of the network. And um, today I'll, I'll introduce you to the team in just a second. And then we'll talk about some of the, the funding that we've got and things that you might apply for. But before I do that, I think Will's thrown in a slide here. Um, just to remind us that the event is going to be recorded. So um, you, people will be able to access it later. If those who couldn't make the session will be able to access the recording. So please make sure that you mute your microphone. I think Will's done that for everybody now. Um, but please feel to, free to use the chat um, to ask any questions. So into that then um, is a network, as I say, that's funded just under four million. It's running just over three years. And it's all about um, human insight for industry. It's all about trying to understand how people think, behave, and how we can harness that to help build a stronger, more digital manufacturing sector. And that's what we're all about. So I'm going to, first of all, introduce the team. Some of them have only been with us for a few weeks, <laughs> um, but it's worth just, you, you knowing the names. So most of you know me, Jill McBride. I'm normally based at Strathclyde University, where I'm professor of innovation and operations management. I'm also director of the Hunter Centre at Strathclyde. And my co-director is Jan. Jan, give us a wave. Jan Godsell. Um, and she is a professor um, in supply chain and operations, but she's also the dean um, of the School of Business and Economics at Loughborough University. And then we've got our, um, our support team who have just joined us. So we've got Angela, Angela Stewart, who's our programme manager. Thanks, Angela. Give us a wave. And we've got Will, um, who you've heard me speaking to already. Will uh, Blackshaw, he's our comms manager. Give us a wave, Will. You probably see a lot of Will. Um, and then we've got Sasha and Sasha and Anand. Um, again, thanks for the wave, uh, uh, Sasha. And he's our impact manager. So that's our that's our team. And what we're all about is this pioneering human insight for industry. Um, if you can see the diagram here, um, I'll talk you through basically. So the core team's in the middle. Um, a number of things that we're we're really keen on doing. And if we start with the the on my my screen, it's on the left. It might not be in yours. But one of the things we're trying to do is we're trying to build a network 
to support manufacturing industry. And that's already populated by lots of people within manufacturing and people that make industrial technologies, policymakers and so on. But what we're bringing to the party is more the kind of economic and social science community and how we bring that um, uh, these people into the network. So to help us, we'll be running a number of events. So we've got a knowledge exchange programme, a network programme, a knowledge exchange programme, where we'll be putting on events, um, discovery days, um, international talks, all, all these kind of things that we hope you'll join us in. And the other side of the diagram, there's the kind of research side. And what we said there is we want to try and curate, amplify and augment the research base. And what we mean by that is we understand that the economic and social sciences have got a lot of knowledge and um, a lot of research has been done that could be used to support manufacturing and digital. Um, but at the moment is maybe hidden in, in kind of pockets and disciplines. So part of what we're trying to do is pull that out and make it more usable. But there's also new research that's needed. So we're going to fund some stuff that we're, we're pulling out of existing knowledge. And um, uh, 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 Sashin will help us with that in terms of making things more impactful, maybe work that's already been done. But we'll also be funding um, quite a lot of new work where we see gaps. So look out for, for future calls. We've also got a kind of core research program. So there's a research already there that we're starting to build to try and pull things together and be the anchor. And for that research, our focus is around the future of manufacturing. So we're looking, we've got three streams looking at the future of manufacturing, which is about what will manufacturing look like? Will it be more distributed? Um, what will supply chains look like? Where will it happen? The second theme is about the future of manufacturing work. And that's more about the people and the jobs and these kind of things and the skills. And then the third topic we've got in our core research is about the future of the economy, because we recognise that the, they're very closely related. Things that happen in the wider environment, the economy will affect manufacturing. And, and equally, things that we do, decisions we make around manufacturing may affect the economy, the things that we buy and our, our prices and so on. And underneath that, um, at the bottom there, you see there's obviously that impact acceleration. So we're trying to make our things that we do very, very usable. And we've also got a storytelling academy, um, which is quite novel. We reckon that manufacturing needs to be um, shouted about a bit more as being an exciting area to work in. So we're, as part of this grant, we're going to be training people to tell positive stories. And we've, we've um, employed a, a group of storytelling professionals at Loughborough University um, who are going to help us with that. So you'll hear more about that later, but today is really all about um, these systematic reviews. Um, and this is the first thing we're doing as part of our, um, our, our programme of, of calls. Now, this is our initial six month plan, and I'm not going to go into lots of detail with this. But you'll see there, January is the launch of our first, first funding call, which is for systematic reviews. Now, we're going to have six systematic reviews in total, two every year. So today we're, we're launching the first two calls of, for systematic reviews. Next month, I'll be launching a call for small funding for early career people, um, really small pots of money um, where we can get um, postgraduate researchers and kind of postdoc researchers and, and people who are just starting out their, their first lectureships and so on, early career people, to give them a little pot of money to help engage with these activities. Um, then in March, we're going to focus on our future of work and there's going to be a lot of activity and a lot of events around that. Um, in April, we're launching our impact funding and Sasha will um, be telling you more about that in a future event. But again, there'll be funding to help make research that's been done much more useful. Um, in May, we're doing a focus on our, our first topic about the future of manufacturing ecosystems. Again, lots of events around that. And then the next big funding call will come just at the start of June. And that's where we'll have an open call where people within economic and social science will be able to bid for funding for projects that they think would, would be of interest in this area. But for today, we're just focusing on these systematic reviews. So what are we going to talk about? Um, I've kind of introduced it. Um, and then there's two, the, 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 the call for systematic reviews, there's two of them. And the first one is asking the question about um, business cases. When we were out doing our research in the summer and speaking to people, 
we saw that there was there was a need for something around business cases. How do we make it easier to make a business case around digital technologies? So Jan's invited along, Jan's going to say a few words, and then she's invited along a couple of people who are going to say a few words um, to kind of back up the kind of need for this. And then the second topic that we're inviting applications is looking at what can we learn from history and what can we learn from other countries? We're talking about this kind of digital revolution and it's the next, the fourth industrial revolution. But what does that really mean and how can we put it in context? So I'm going to say a few words about that. And then I looked at the, less formally, I looked at the, the people that had signed up um, last night and I kind of nobbled a couple of people who know far more about history and international perspectives than me. Um, and I'm going to call upon them to say a few words, but nothing very formal. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Jan, who will introduce the first um, the first topic for our systematic reviews, which is around business cases. Jan. Thank you, Jill. So as Jill said, um, I've recently joined Loughborough. I joined Loughborough in September. And prior to that, for the last eight years, I was at WMG. And one of the amazing things about being at WMG, it was very technology driven. Um, but I was perhaps responsible for the part of WMG, which was around organisational and societal transformation that enabled that. And as a result of this, um, we quite often worked with organisations who perhaps had initially started to engage because there was a technological need. Maybe these were companies that were trying to develop a new have metals with different properties or we're trying to um, find a different joining technology but actually what we've started to find as we worked with these organizations that um, there was more that we could do particularly in terms of looking at their manufacturing strategies and um, their supply chain strategy but interestingly one of the things that began to become apparent particularly as we started to do our work around looking at industry four and industry four readiness um, was that it was becoming slightly problematic to be able to make a business case for some of these new technologies. And it made me think back to right when I made my segue from industry into academia, and that was years ago when I joined Cranfield University, well over um, 20 years ago. And um, at the time, um, there was a guy from, um, I think it was um, Unilever, um, but it may have been PNG, in fact it wasn't, it was PNG, who actually PNG wanted to make an investment in an ERP system, an enterprise resource planning system, and on paper it would never stack up. It was just too much money and it was very difficult to develop the business case that would say, but the company absolutely knew that in order to underpin their future success, they needed to make that strategic investment. And I'll never forget, um, the director speaking to me and saying, we know we've got to do this, we can't develop a business case, so we're going to take that leap of faith. And that was right at the beginning of my academic career, but I think as we have moved beyond ERP systems into some of the new types of industrial digital technologies that can support manufacturing, the case has become even stronger. And so what I would like to do is to share with you, I suppose, some of my journey over the last 20 years that's led to this point, but then more importantly, I'm going to hand over to two people. Firstly, um, Matt Yates, who perhaps can extend that story because he was perhaps one of the industrialists when I was at WMG that we worked with more closely to actually understand that connection. And then to Chris Clamo, who I actually met um, uh, a number of years ago when he was working for a consumer packaged goods company really, really driving forward the change to their new target operating model, but perhaps had to see some of these decisions for real in a large global multinational context. But now it's perhaps seeing that, con that from a slightly different context as a provider of one of these industrial digital technologies. He now has the issue of getting clients to be able to develop business cases to use something that they know is very, very useful and meaningful but they have to convince others in their organisations that that is the right thing to do as well. So two very different perspectives, but hopefully I can provide some background and context. 
So I think for some of you may have, have attended some of our previous webinars, um, you're aware of the work that we did, which is perhaps looking at what manufacturing could look like by 2035. And I'm just recapping now that perhaps more positive aspect of what we could do to create a flourishing world. And we will create this flourishing world if we collectively choose to start to adopt more sustainable and circular economy practices, um, including the policies and regulations that may support that. That actually we do pioneer the use of industrial digital technologies and we make sure that we integrate those into our new business models, which will absolutely be required because this um, connection we see between consumption and production, if we're truly going to start to meet some of the drivers around net zero and carbon neutral by 2050, we need to start decoupling consumption from production and thinking about different ways to support businesses to make money. And this will require different approaches to collaboration and potentially a greater dependence on cooperation. Now, the benefits of taking this approach would mean that by 2035, our flourishing world will be defined by this sort of single global market that does have sufficient raw materials and resources. So some of the issues we've seen coming out of COVID, you know, the shortages of semiconductors that have been reported again in the news, um, or um, some of the price inflation that we're seeing as we see demand and supply rebalancing uh, post COVID will not be an issue. But interestingly, we'll see a diminished trade flow of finished goods. And that's because what we'll start to see is that regions are starting to compete in a more self-sufficient way based on sustainability. And so what we'll start to see is that um, regions start to better embrace the principles of the circular economy to try to keep products in the highest possible value state, you know, that decoupling of consumption and production. And what this will mean is that manufacturing firms have no longer just focused on those forward facing manufacturing processes. They don't just think about producing components or finished goods. They're actually thinking much more about new business models and the way that they might actually support the circular economy and the repair, the remanufacture, the reuse. Um, and this is driven by a focus on customer value creation. And as a result of creating these new business models that are more resource efficient, we can gain um, better cost or uh, more attractive cost structures and um, see significant productivity gains. And um, what this will mean, though, is that we actually need to invest in new circular economy practices. We actually need to start upskilling our staff to actually think about this focus on more secondary production. And we really need to start to realise the value in the stuff that we've already got. And what this will start to see is a creation of new jobs in recycling, reverse logistics, and very much in those secondary markets around upgrade, repair and remanufacturing. And what this could mean is that from a manufacturing and supply chain perspective, that we really start to see the development of regional manufacturing hubs across the UK. And actually the work package that I'll lead um, as part of the core research pro programme, looking at the um, future of manufacturing ecosystems, really starts to take the concept. Initially, we'll look at the Midlands, but think about what that could mean for other regions. And in a way, this could be characterised at the moment, if you think about the Midlands region, we have a region that has many factories within it. And actually, it has a lot of logistics providers within it. And we tend to look at those two systems separately. And just think back a few months to the fuel crisis. We had the fuel in the country. Um, we also had lateral flow tests in the country before Christmas. They just weren't in the right place. And so actually, as we start to look at manufacturing and supply chains, we need to start to think of this as a seamless system as opposed to manufacturing sites and logistics. And actually, perhaps the best way to think about this is we will start to think about the Midlands as a factory, as opposed to the Midlands as a region with a number of factories within it. And the benefits of taking this type of approach could be that we can really start to leverage the benefits of these closed loop models. We start to avoid those risks from resource price fluctuations and we get some digital transparency. But in order for us to do this, we need to have that circular economy business model and infrastructure underpinning it. We need to have actually perhaps changed consumer behaviour to actually start to value utility and not newness. And we need to have that underpinning infrastructure of low carbon um, energy and also connectivity to enable that to take place. Because this will actually create a future of distributed manufacturing that is much more socially levelling. 
um, which is really, really important if you think about the agenda, not just for the UK, where it's high up the economic agenda, but this should also be socially levelling regionally and globally because we actually take some of that unit of production away from that fun factory to actually thinking about the machine. And we move away from competing on economies of scale, which has perhaps seen some of our manufacturing activities driven to large factories in certain locations around the world, to actually thinking about how we, um, uh, how we can compete through economies of scope. And this is really, really important if we want to build resilience into both our supply chains, but also to our economy. And this may mean that we have the ability to produce customised products and produce things in a batch size of one, though that may not always be required. But it also means that rather than having very centralised positioning of assets, it could be much, much more distributed. But we can only do this if we get very, very high degrees of connectivity. And actually, we probably only could compete going forward if we actually start to factor in the cost of carbon. And so we don't just think about our traditional manufacturing notions of cost, quality and time and trade those off. But we actually start to build into that equation the cost of carbon and we integrate our new approach to distributed manufacturing with a low carbon infrastructure. And as I previously mentioned, this also requires us not to think about uh, making and moving separately. We need to think about this as one network where we have that seamless interplay between make and move. And our driver is responsible consumption. We are really trying to ensure that everybody, um, both within the UK and beyond, has access to the services that they need. But we do so in a way that is responsible and we're using we're, we're using at a rate and in a way that's um, trading off in a more responsible way, the environmental, the social and the economic drivers. And this absolutely means that we need to start thinking about things in a more circular way, keeping things in their highest possible value state and actually enabling consumers to make choices, not just based on cost, but based on a proper trade off between um, the cost implications, um, the environmental implications and the social implications of what they're consuming. And actually what our research identified was that there's two pathways to improvements and um for those of you who are interested, you may have seen in some of our previous presentations us talking about some of these archetypes, but I can pop into the chat function afterwards a link um, to some of the materials for those of you who are interested, particularly in these archetypes in more detail. But the key message that I just wanted to pull out really is that both the pathways to improvement, the pathways to actually um, moving us forward to that flourishing world, either um, involve the adoption of industrial digital technologies or improving supply chain integration. And both of those actually require an investment in digital technologies. And actually, if we look at research from others, so this is um, some research done by Gartner, who are quite a leading player um, looking at manufacturing supply chains, then actually what they've identified moving forward is that product as a service is going to be the leading growth play, slightly Americanized um, terminology there. But essentially what they've identified is that the way that firms are going to move forward and perhaps the, the, um, the first thing that they can do to actually help them implement um, this move towards a circular economy is to actually start looking at how they move from just providing pure products to products as a service. So for instance, HP, HP did this, you can still buy ink cartridges. Um, normally they're very expensive and if you're anything like me, you're making some rapid dash to a supermarket to buy them um, as a distress purchase. Whereas about seven years ago when my son started secondary school, I migrated to the instant ink subscription model. So my printer is IoT enabled. Basically, it just connects to the Internet. I pay a £3.50 a month subscription. I can print up to 100 pages a month. I can over, over go. And over time, if I was to always do that, they might start charging me a little bit more. And over the seven years that I've used it, I've never run out of ink. I can print in colour, black or white. I've saved probably it's about a third of the original cost I was paying when I bought cartridges. But more importantly, for HP, it gives them precise um, information about demand. They've also made their ink magic. The cartridges have got bigger. They probably send them out to me once a year. And um, it's a fully circular model in that I return the cartridges. They um, 
refill them and send them back out. So it's a really interesting example how alongside a traditional business model, they've moved to product as a service. And this is what Gartner believe is going to be a pathway for many manufacturers to better embrace the circular economy. And actually, we then did some in-depth case studies, and this is a case study um, with a manufacturing firm who itself, when um, the senior management team of that firm were interviewed, essentially said that at the moment their predominantly provision was about products, but what they could see that within five to ten years their dominant provision was going to be a product with a relatively small service, so not necessarily fully servitized, but with a service surround. And what they saw that service surround being is in terms of or delivering would be around supply chain efficiency and delivery performance. It would perhaps align better to customer needs and provide an improved customer series experience it would provide better co-creation and development of new products and it would have a lot of technical and advisory support but this company also had identified that in order to make this transition there was going to be a leap of faith because actually as they started to look at the type of investments they might need to make their current business case being a traditional manufacturing organisation that over the years had a very, very robust capital expenditure approach that the whole business planning process or, or ca business case process was actually developed around assuming you bought a physical fixed asset, it generated X amount of sales and therefore it sold its, it, it had a return on investment of X number of years and based on that payback an investment would be made. And what they were finding is there was digital innovations that they knew would make sense from a business perspective to invest in. Their gut feel told them it was the right thing to do, but the current approach to putting together a business plan wasn't stacking up. And so what they identified um, was that the current processes weren't effective for supporting new routes to market or for new business models. Over 50% of the executives interviewed found that they weren't effective for, um, new, uh, for supporting new routes to market and around 40% for new business models. And actually some of the limitations of the current investment process that they saw that um, that it actually didn't cover, consider many of the intangible assets. Uh, aspects. So, for instance, things like ability to access innovation, the inability, the inability to access IT. Um, it didn't enable them to access new digital models, and it didn't enable them to build these intangible elements into the business case. And what they also identified was that there was an over reliance on financial evaluation. There was a fixation with a very, very fast return on investment, and sometimes this meant that they weren't actually considering. Um, the a lot the strategic alignment of in the investment into um, the strategic direction that the firm was headed it was reduced very very much to an ROI calculation and so what this identified and I suppose in a way this is the start of a five-year journey that's taken us towards this call as Jill identified further reinforced by the sort of uh, phase one research that we did between March and July that we need to take a more strategic um, approach to looking at the investment evaluation process and for instance we need to think about things like um, learning and acquired knowledge and how that is added as a business benefit how we actually can make a shift to looking at things like longer time horizons how do we quantify and think about um, intangible things like added value or business benefits and also what do we think about um, the alignment to the strategic perspective or um, how do we think about the relevance of the technology and how that is added as a business benefit and yesterday just talking this through with Chris Courtney who um, is the challenge director he is, he's got what's what working hypothesis which I think um, early indicative research would support that actually it can sometimes be easier to justify an investment in an industrial digital technology if you're trying to do that to support a new business model than it can be if you're trying to um, build the case for um, putting an industrial digital technology into an existing um, business model. And I suppose what this just identifies, it's time for a rethink. And actually what we know is there's lots of research out there that tackles this problem from various different dimensions. 
but our business community, our end users, the manufacturers, the industrial digital technology providers, and even policymakers would really, really benefit from a more systematic and definitive piece of work that we can all leverage to actually think about how we accelerate the adoption of industrial digital technologies because we're actually making it easier for people to build those business cases to get people to invest. And so without further ado, I'm going to hand over to the first of our two industrial speakers who can build on um, what I've said and explain this from their perspective. And so, Matt, I hope you've taken control and can flip on to your introductory slide. Yeah, thanks, Jan. I think so. Please tell me if it's um, not working. We're good. So Matt, you're probably best to give your background because you're very you're even newer to a new job than I am. <laughs> yeah, I'm a couple of weeks into a new job, as it says here, with an, an electronics manufacturer in the UK. But uh, I spent a significant amount of time in the uh, in metals industry uh, prior to that. And the context of just talking to you today is um, it comes from a piece of work that I was uh, leading there in, back in 2017 through to uh, early last year, uh, looking at how new digital business models could be used to, to leverage what's a very traditional manufacturing context for that, uh, for that company. So I, I think, you know, there's lots of parallels to draw from the, uh, the context here to what the uh, Jan's talking about in terms of the circular economy, um, where digital is, is a key enabler. My, you know, let's be honest, the sustainability agenda is really front and central now. Back in 2017, that wasn't a feature of what we were doing here. We were trying to explore how we could leverage digital in the commercial sense uh, to access new opportunities in the market and also enable uh, a value chain which was never going to invest in digital end to end itself uh, to start to move forward. So in that um, kind of context of uh, the, the commercial uh, opportunity that we were looking at, we started in a place that said, you know, how do we leverage this uh, rapidly changing digital context in, uh, in an industrial sense? And one of the few things that um, were very clear to us early on is that uh, digital wasn't going to offer just an additional channel um, in terms of uh, substitution. It was very much going to be something which needed a completely new focus to take our products uh, through that uh, place to market and also gave the opportunity to, uh, for others to join a platform that would eventually build into an ecosystem to give them access to a wider market opportunity as well. And I think you know, I'll talk about it in the next slide, but in, in the B2B context, this was very new. In our lives as consumers, you know, we all uh, expect to book travel and uh, get our entertainment and do our shopping through some very simple and uh, value adding in terms of our personal life opportunities uh, that uh, retailers and, and such offer online. But in the B2B context, it was very, very new at this time, particularly in the industrial context that we were talking about. But nevertheless, B2B customers still expect the same thing. It was using a different, if you like, approach to get those outcomes of service and, and customer centricity. But uh, we were looking at how digital could apply uh, those same benefits uh, to a wider audience and <clears throat> something that would bring value to customers ultimately. So you might say, well, OK, so who's really interested if they're buying uh, metals online in, uh, in, sorry, buying metals to move to an online opportunity. Nobody who buys metals in a company for the last 15 or 20 years turns up on Monday and says, you know, I'm going to Google today to see where I can find my next opportunity. And, you know, that was some of the challenges that uh, we were facing in terms of this particular business model. But nevertheless, you could, we could carve out some characteristics which people were expecting and the type of people that would be finding value in this model. And you can read them here. I'm not going to read them out so individually, but you know, they're, they're very obvious in some circumstances, you might say, but sometimes you know, it's really key to have those in the, in the center of your thought process about you, how you scope and develop uh, the services and the, uh, the interaction and availability of uh, the model that you build, because it doesn't disappear that people are in business to be efficient and make money and you know just 
turning those things on their head because you've got a digital opportunity for somebody uh, doesn't change their opinion about the, the, uh, the kind of characteristics they're looking for, like value for money and quality assurance and service being absolutely at the core of uh, their requirements. In the same way that credit and payment facilities in the retail context have moved on in leaps and bounds, they're still very much you know, more business-led transactions in the, uh, in the commercial context and B2B that we talk about here. So as we move through this um, creation of this new digital platform, we were very clear that we were in a traditional marketplace and we were going to bring some disruption. I think we underestimated the disruption that it would bring by about a factor of 50. Um, I spent most of my life leading uh, that business, managing you know, stakeholders and and you know, promoting the benefits of uh, what we were doing uh, to what you might say was was often a very uh, cynical group of uh, of stakeholders. And as in everything in life, you get that broad spectrum of people that want to be early adopters and move forward and seek the opportunity through to those that just want to, you know, dig in and stop anything like this ever changing the way that they work because those norms that form in the market and sort of traditional internal approaches of were uh, being challenged in every way, shape or form by uh, the, the business model that we were proposing. And we developed a phrase, I've put it there, but you know, very much even in our own business, we were disrupting our route to market and the, uh, the corporate antibodies, as I called them, were very much uh, the part of the challenge at you know, divorcing their point of view from the value that could be created through this business case and the business opportunity for, for future uh, evolution of uh, the business in the broader context. So the model uh, that anyone is thinking about developing in our, in our particular sense is, is has to be fairly clearly articulated from the from the beginning. But one thing I will say is you won't articulate 100% of where you end up, particularly two or three years down the road. But realizing whether it's overlapping or it's going to be adjacent is a key factor in that communication process, because otherwise it really starts to jar with the way the business approaches some or all of its customers, which uh, is, is going to be problematic in the in beginning and will start to destroy um, you know, people looking at this as an alternative way to justify uh, new approaches. Um, value generation also starts to change because in the manufacturing context, you know, we weren't just making something to sell it to a customer uh, for it to continue to have value added down uh, a value chain into, into an end use. We were starting to, to generate value and revenue opportunities from commissions and license fees and you know, a very different uh, set of uh, criteria to get around and, and manage for many people in the manufacturing organisation. And as Jan was saying, when people talk about investment cases in the manufacturing industry, it's very easy to put your, uh, your hand on something physical that you've invested in and look for that um, asset delivering a return over its lifetime that's going to um, justify that investment. And I think understanding the risks and rewards around digital is absolutely a leap of, leap of faith for many an organisation, particularly in the traditional context. And as you develop, if you like, asset light digital opportunities, um, there's plenty of people out there who want to uh, even disrupt where you think you are using your market and customer understanding to, uh, to leverage your own opportunity. So digital attackers building barriers to entry was a, was a key factor in our consideration in terms of supporting and justifying how this could continue. Um, I think you know shifting towards value creation from digital needs to be very explicit in a strategy as well, and you know having digital on a on a strategy slide and you know in there for your shareholders has been something that's been apparent for probably a decade now. Actually, understanding what that means on the ground, I think we're far further on, and it, it needs to be more explicitly defined. And some of the challenges that uh, as, as this context is is going to explore around 
people and the way they approach those opportunities and understand them is, is a massive factor that we came across in the early days of doing this. And if I just circle back to the investment case, then you look at a, a, a model that you know is going to disrupt. It's, as, as Jan's outlined, and I won't repeat, it's very difficult to look at it as a CapEx case. It never meets the prioritization criteria that you'd find in, in a traditional manufacturing industry that wants to wants to move on its capability in, in a physical asset sense. So you can look at it from another perspective, which says, well, I will, you know, we'll, we'll run this through an operational spend. And one of the things is very clear as you pivot from you know, running assets into running digital, then you can have a very high cost of employment, which people uh, again don't normally associate with um, the efficiencies they've been looking for in, in manufacturing and automation over the years and some of the timings and assumptions around growth can be particularly challenging they're often ambitious and, and it will be a continued drag on an operational spend and you know when this happens the independence of some of the decisions around the model they get lost so you know, look at the third uh, bubble in there. If you if you were to have an, an ideal situation, I think probably having a standalone context for something that's um, you're building that's going to disrupt your own um, traditional setup is uh, is probably the best place to be. Um, you may be potentially more exposed to market forces and 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 the way that the the business or the, or the, or the in the broader context wants to fund that opportunity, but separating it from some of those um, stifling traditional approaches to not only the kind of financial justification but the operational context is well worthwhile, particularly in the finance sense. I will say as well, how you measure those businesses can be very very different. Which is where I just kind of finish off on this slide, just to uh, indicate some of those levers that, which we found uh, would lead to success, and some of those which you know really do challenge the traditional norms. So I'll not read every single one, but I think it's you know they they bring out some some learning over that period of time about what not to do around governance, which I've touched on, um, both financially and in terms of the organisational setup, and and don't you know force the review cycle to be exactly the same as, as the traditional models would have been and recognize very early on as well that the skill set which you uh, need to equip people to with to be successful in this models is very very different from maybe the skill set which you traditionally bring into uh, you know a manufacturing context not to say that people can't transition across the two but i think you know the, the from the very beginning, learning that new ideas often come from, you know, very different uh, contexts in terms of hiring. Um, in terms of policies, you know, we, we build a, a big framework around most organisations to control the way things happen for the for, for the right reasons, but quite often they don't fit with how you want to run and operate a smaller, more agile, disruptive business model, certainly at the early stages of uh, of its um of its growth from uh, you know an early idea into it into a venture that eventually goes on to into a, a more fully fledged operating model and, and and i've said before you know trying to integrate it into the core business in that sense really doesn't work so you know what really helped us move forward was using some fairly um uh, kind of inverted metrics to look at the unit economics and the top line growth um we were allowed to be very autonomous in our decision making uh, which allowed us to move quickly and to, uh, and to and to react to what we were seeing in the marketplace because uh, it was new and the things that we thought we knew from the from the market early on were often uh, proven to be wrong and we needed to pivot and change what we were doing and spend our money quite um maybe in quite a different fashion to to enable that that kind of pivot to happen. Um, and if you're taking an industrial context and looking at how you can leverage digital, you know, you have to absolutely recognize that industry talent complements, but a startup approach is absolutely the, the best way to, to get off the ground quickly and, you know, align people to some incentives which traditional businesses aren't, aren't able necessarily to um, to adopt. 
I think, you know, in in building functionalities, we we did that with, um, as I said, very rapid iteration in learning, and you know, I think one of the things that uh, made our success uh, stronger than maybe many people had anticipated in the business was, you know, that speed of being able to execute and uh, and read the feedback from from the marketplace and bring value where um, where we quickly learning there was opportunity, and. I'll finish off with you know one one phrase because it, it it kind of captured the context of the difference of what we were doing, but the chief exec was with us one day reviewing how where we'd got to in the business model, and he was a key sponsor, and he said to me, Matt, if I had a hundred of these ventures in my core business or in our core business, we wouldn't face some of the problems that we do today, and I think that talks a lot about the difference in approach and how we'll have to move forward as manufacturers in you know developing this future that looks like the, the flourishing world of 2035, which uh, Jan's articulated. OK, I hope that's helpful. I'll hand over to Chris now, I think. That was great, Matt, thank you. Chris, oh, do you have control? I have, ooh, God, that's the first time in my life. Um, OK. Afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks very much, Matt. Uh, brief introduction first, I suppose. <clears throat> My name is Chris Clemo. Um, I've worked for 30 years in industry um, with a lot of household names you might have heard of, Mogul, Mars, Danone, and British American Tobacco, that consumer yeah. goods company that Jan talked about. Um, Background as a former head of global procurement um, for two of those organizations, I know a little bit about the motivations and buying decisions that uh, companies have concerning IT, software, digital technologies. I've also led supply chain and IT functions. So uh, I've personally had to deliver several global programs uh, that have leveraged IT uh, to make major transformational outcomes in businesses. So I know a few stories as a kind of poacher and gamekeeper, to be honest, in the software and IT space. Now I find myself as an investor, and so I invest in businesses, so I do my own business cases, uh, and also I'm an advisor, and particularly to a company called SupplyView. Um, have I got the right slide here? Yeah, let me just do this. Right. Um, SupplyView, so just as a bit of an introduction, is a business that um, is right at the heart of some of the agenda that Jan was talking about because it enables companies to achieve high performing supply chains that are synchronized and sustainable through the application of what you call digital technology. So it kind of curates data to create a digital twin of supply chain, provides true visibility performance, leverages sort of genetic algorithms, heuristics and to model scenarios adjust how the supply chain should be planned and run for future performance. So what it does is it optimizes not only people's supply chains, but also a network of supply chains, you know, so that extended network, uh, and also looks at optimization, things like just cost, quality, but also now carbon and things like this. So very much at the heart of some of the things that uh, can enable that uh, vision that Jan was talking about. So um, I'm happy to share my experience with you. Uh, the brief was to talk a little bit about uh, a few things. As Jan will probably tell you, I could talk for days about just about anything, but I've only got about 10 minutes. So I'm going to talk basically about two things. So um, the, uh, you know, how did tech companies, my experience, make themselves more attractive to customers and the trials and tribulations of business case in the modern world? And the other thing that particularly impacts us is around the, the benefits and downsides of trying to sell and justify SaaS as a, as a technology platform, software as a service. Okay, so let's talk about the business case. Um, <clears throat> you know, some people think business cases kind of have a sort of mythical status. You know, it'll pronounce on high what the right thing to do is. Sadly, in my experience, that's not normally the case. Uh, business cases and the quality of them vary enormously, depending on the time and effort and the experience that you invest to produce it. But the key thing is that fundamentally a business case, in my opinion, provides a justification, not the decision to buy something. It's a supporting document that confirms stakeholders' minds what they think they already want to do. So therefore, what stakeholders 
look for in a business case is very colored on what drives or motivates them, okay? So if you look at a finance guy, you know, they look at return on investment, you know, I've seen loads of finance guys in my experience check the internal rate of return of a project, see that it's higher than a company weighted cost of capital, sign the contract, and then mentally book the savings into the next quarter results with no thought of the implementation or risk, because that's how finance guys think. You know, not all of them, but a lot of them do. Marketing directors, on the other hand, don't really care about the cost. They just talk about growth in the business case. And operations directors, the people we talk to, they just want a business case that lowers their operating costs and make their life easier, okay? So that's fine, but what you see is that my experience, the buying decision around software is funded on a belief from the sponsor you're aiming at, that buying this IT or technology is a good thing, right? It's an essentially an emotional decision, backed up by whatever facts are important to them, given what their motivations are. That's why I think if you're going to be successful selling IT, software, digital solutions, first and foremost, it's based on a relationship selling process. It's understanding the buyer's motivations, and therefore a good business case has to reflect that approach. Okay. So what do you do when it comes to software? Well, firstly, I think you have to clearly articulate the connection from the software, the app, the features to the business needs. This is a use case right? How they align to the company and therefore the stakeholders' priorities uh, is often the, of, of, often the difference between a good and a bad one. I mean, a clearly articulated use case um, and what the features do and how they enable to make things better is a better answer than just saying things like it's the latest thing or everyone else is doing it. So a use case is critical. Um, when you look at benefits uh, as well, business cases, they have to talk about the investment costs and therefore benefits. Um, and you know, benefits can be broadly categorized on increased effectiveness or efficiency. When you look at supply chain particularly, efficiency uh, um, really often comes down to things like lower working capital or high utilization of installed plant or capacity. Actually, with the right approach, it's quite easy to analyze and predict working capital savings by enabling something or doing something different. However, what we find in today's interconnected supply chains, working capital savings might not always occur where the investment is made. For example, if you've got a consumer goods company investing in a supply chain planning software that reduces working capital across this extended network, you know, the savings might actually occur in the customer's warehouse, right? And therefore, you might not see the savings in where you're making the investment. And then when you're kind of negotiating with Tesco or so on to try and say we should get a better price or something because we saved some stock, you know those negotiations tend to be only going one way, right? <laughs> so it's difficult to get the money back. So again, in an extended world, looking at efficiency savings and things like working capital, particularly in the supply chain, it's often difficult to allocate those savings to where the investment is there, okay? Effectiveness, uh, on the other hand, although it's more difficult to substantiate, can be a much more powerful way in which you can justify investment. Um, you know, when it comes to supply chain, it comes down to things like getting better, be better customer service, faster route to market, quicker new product introduction. Linking these improvements to increased financial metrics such as sales or margin is hard. And you get the challenge that operations functions might want to invest in new IT to improve customer service, but the benefit incurs in the sales and marketing area. And they might be tempted to claim the benefit and arising from their own initiatives and not what ops did. So again, a tricky thing about attaching the benefit to where the investment is made. So I say a nice round of business case should have elements of both effectiveness and efficiency that provides a justification for that particular sponsor to invest, plus some extra goodies for others, right? And a benchmark and a baseline with key performance indicators are very necessary because it sets the foundation for a very important activity called benefit realization. And most companies fail to do it very well. When you're deploying software of multi-years um, deployment, it means that the ground changes from the day of the investment. This can sometimes make it very hard to justify or identify the benefits and whether they've occurred or not. 
And also that, what I talked about earlier, that benefit grabbing by other functions or projects becomes a big issue. And it undermines the original justification, making it harder for a contract extension or on sale uh, in the future. And also to benefit from um, you know, building on the original investment. So the challenge for IT sellers in the supply chain space is that the users of the software are more interested in efficiency because of targets and cost savings to achieve, but the buyers as well tend to be focused on other things. So the ops person might want to actually invest, but actually the FD is looking at things like growth because they tend to be incentivized on that. So understanding all the stakeholders and the buying process in a prospective customer is therefore very vital and the business case justification needs to appeal broadly to them. The other thing I want to talk about is SaaS, right? Um, and first and foremost, you know, software as a service. And SaaS works for the customer because when you used to buy tech in the old days, it meant buying a license up front, spending two years and millions of pounds trying to bend it to your way of working. And that hidden cost of investment was always very large and made people very wary about investing in tech and software. Now, SaaS is more like a lease arrangement, which means you rent the software, essentially pre-configured, and then you can start to use it almost straight away. So ultimately, the lifetime costs may actually be a bit higher, but the speed of benefits and capture should be quicker. Also, the fact that the software is pre-configured forces more adoption in businesses rather than adaption, which means that future upgrades, implementing best practice is easier going forward. Also, there are no hosting, maintenance, or license upgrade hidden costs, and a use by seat is more aligned to kind of the actual adoption of the features and the improvement that you should get. Although the change management elements are usually often underestimated to adopt pre-configured SaaS features. Okay. So it works for the customer, and does it work for the seller? Well, the good thing is it's a smoother and more predictable revenue stream. So you get monthly invoices of revenue as opposed to a one-off big check. And also, because you're building that interaction, not only selling software, but also the services around it, as Jan talked about, you build a closer interaction. And you can help shape and prove future developments and provide a more effective platform for a broadening relationship. Obviously, it's all great, but there are some downsides. So, um, you know, from a customer's point of view, you know, you've got to be prepared to adopt and not adapt. So the change management implications. IT security and data quality is an emerging issue. Um, moving transactions into a cloud for a business often gives companies nightmares, particularly in their traditional IT departments. And also um, a key thing as well around technology generally is a sharper focus on inherent data quality within a businesses can be a problem. Though it's true for all IT applications, SaaS tends to be the first thing you look at is you're trying to get the data out of a business and you realize that it's not in a good spot. You can't use the software. For the seller, um, you know, actually building SaaS solutions is more expensive, uh, although you can amortize it across multiple customers. Got to maintain the software, uh, the support costs and having to maintain the effective support model. And ultimately, the big issue is the software actually has to work, which is not always the case with some other stuff. So it's a strong case, I think, to promote the use of SaaS for sellers and customers. But sadly, the problem is, from a business case point of view, finance does not always necessarily agree with that. So under IFRS rules, software or IT can be capitalized as a project traditionally, and therefore depreciated over several years. Um, and whilst the, you know, an ever increasing depreciation line is a problem for companies, it, it kind of does lower the entry cost for customers from a P&L point of view, therefore making the buying decision at the start easier from a financial justification point of view. Though of course, the cash is still the same. SaaS, unfortunately, can't be capitalized, although there are some elements of an implementation that can be. Therefore, the costs tend to hit the P&L from day one, which means that there's an added pressure to drive rapid adoption and to return P&L benefits quickly as the investment costs need to be covered. I mean, this can shape the nature and the types of SaaS services that are successful in the marketplace and also uh, drive the way in which the business cases are created. Okay, so um, really in summary, what I'd say, my takeouts from my experience is, you know, that you know, all investment decisions do need a business case to support them. The quality of the business case depends a lot on the approach, 
the time spent and the experience that goes into it goes without saying. The key point is that in my experience, the decision to buy is still ultimately an emotional one. And it's justified by a business case that has to appeal to the key stakeholders' motivations. So therefore, a broad business case should have both effectiveness and efficiency outcomes that should appeal to those stakeholders. One of the particular challenges for supply view and supply chains in general is benefits don't always arise when the investment decision is made. You know, key point business cases are live documents and should be tracked through a life cycle with benefit realization. Although SaaS is the way forward because benefits to the buyers are clear, lower upfront costs and sellers, better long term platform for growth. The key thing is business cases can't hide for SaaS or behind capitalization rules. Therefore, you need to focus on very early delivery of benefits. So that was Thanks. me, quick whistle stop tour. Thanks, Any Chris. Questions? Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Just before um, we go on to hand back to Jill, I'm not sure that Matt and um, Chris can stay right the way to the end. So um, anyone in the audience have any questions for Matt or Chris or clarifications? Uh, please either put up your hand or just ask your question out loud. We're a small and um, interactive, no pun intended, group. <laughs> No? Really clear. Brilliant. OK, thank you very much, Chris and Matt. We'll now hand over to Jill. Thanks very much. Um, I started the session by saying Dan and I had spent a lot of time in the summer trying to understand where the gaps in knowledge were and where we felt that the economic and social sciences could contribute towards Made Smarter. And I think Jan, Matt and Chris made it very clear there, the things that we were hearing, particularly from the manufacturers and particularly from the innovators who were developing technologies about how important the business case is. So you can see why like one of our systematic reviews is around that topic, but it's not an easy topic. As, the, as all the speakers talked about, it crosses so many disciplines. You know, the, the marketing people have got a different view from the finance people. And, you know, the work that I'm doing at the moment, looking at the future of manufacturing work, you know, you also alluded to that about how very, very infrequently, um, you know, human resources are actually talked about in the business case. So I think they've made very clear, you know, why we're asking for a systematic review um, around the business case for digital technology investment. So hopefully some of you on the call will be interested in applying for, for um, you know, funding to do this. I'm now going to move on to our second topic and our second topic is on the screen just now. What can we learn from historical and or international perspectives on industrial development and evolution? And I'm going to make a case for why we think that's an important area for systematic reviews. And to be honest, when we were out interviewing people, Jan probably interviewed more of the manufacturers and the innovators. And I interviewed more of the people who the academics from social science and the people from the kind of academic societies, you know, Academy of Management and Campaign for Social Science and so on. So I was hearing an awful lot um, this question about, but we, we can learn things from history or what's happening in other countries. And that's why I kind of put forward the case to, to have a systematic review that looks at these issues. And again, it's complex. It's there's information in lots of different pockets um, of academia um, and not just academia. Um, I should say when we're talking about these systematic reviews, it's possibly not just the academic literature you're looking at. I think there's lots that people are discussing in the media. There's lots in the kind of um, you know, there's podcasts out there, people talking about it and there's there's reports by companies. So don't feel when you're um, doing the systematic review is only the academic literature you're looking at. So we're now moving on to why I think it's important that we look at this historical and international perspectives. Don't need a picture of me. I've already said I'm from stuff, right? Um, but yeah, the, some of the some of the things that, that we were hearing. Um, well, to start off with, why why did they, they fund this network in the first place, Interact? And a big thing was that they wanted to hear new voices. You know, so they were hearing from the manufacturers and the, the um, people developing technologies, and they were hearing from the technology academics. But 
made smarter recognised that they wanted also to hear from the economic and social sciences and its widest forum. Um, so Jan and I both kind of operate very much, we talk to industry coming from a kind of operations supply chain background. Um, I think I probably operate more at the social science and the change aspect, but there's so many aspects of social science that, that aren't involved in the manufacturing conversation. So this particular call, I think, will appeal to a, quite a broad, well, not broad, uh, is broadening the people that are involved in the network, which is great. Um, so some of the things that we were hearing, um, some of the things we were hearing um, were about um, why should we learn from history? Um, and <laughs> one of the things I have to laugh at is we talk a lot about Industry 4 and we hear people saying, you know, it's the fourth industrial revolution. But when you actually stop and ask people that are, that are saying this, what are the other three? It's amazing how few people actually can pinpoint what the other three industrial revolutions were. So, you know, it's, it's a bit of a, a, a blasé comment, but I think it's an important one that if we're talking about this as a fourth industrial revolution. We have to understand what's gone before and there's things that we can learn from it. Um, and the other thing um, that I've got in this slide here is the international perspective. When we were out speaking to people, we heard quite often people saying, well, I can tell you something about things that are happening in other parts of the world, how they're viewing it slightly different. We've got our Made Smarter initiative. We're talking about Industry 4. Um, but in other countries, there's perhaps a different language, but it's the same issue they're talking about. So um, we thought it would be useful to have a systematic review that answers some of these questions. And I'm going to leave it up to you whether, you're do, you whether you choose to say you're doing a review of both historical and international. That would be nice. But if you decide you're going to focus on just one of them, that's OK as well. It doesn't stop you from applying at all. So what did we hear when we were, were having these conversations? Well, as I say, um, people were saying we should learn from history, but we're very quick to point out it's not it's not just about taking the solution that happened one place or in one other or, or in another part of the world and applying it to our current situation, that the context is very important. So I think we have to appreciate that, that it's about understanding the context. Um, another thing that I heard from a lot of social science people was that learning from history is really important because it helps you understand um, human nature. It's not just about um, what happened in history and the actual activities, it's about why did people do it? You know, what were people thinking? Human nature is, is the same, you know, the basic human nature through time. There's a lot of similarities and we can learn from that. So history tells us a bit more about human nature. And the other reason that people said, look at history was about thinking about that longer term view. You know, that we're not just thinking about the current needs for technology, but we're thinking about how is that going to help our companies, our economy, um, our policy makers in the long term? How do things play out over time? And something that, that kind of, um, somebody said this to me in the interviews, and I think it came from a Harvard professor about this. Um, it might not be the, the development of the technology that's really important, but it might be that pause once the technology is developed, that mind the pause, because we're putting a lot of money in Made Smarter into helping um, develop new technologies and the adoption of new technologies. But if you look at history, it's, it's that bit in between about what actually happens. Um, and I think that's quite, quite interesting for us to, to start to think about. And in a similar vein, might be the same person that said this to me, um, thinking about system builders. So it might not be the technologists that are the ones that are really making the big change and, and starting the industrial revolution that we're talking about, but it might be the people that are building systems. And I think the example that I was given there was, you know, Henry Ford didn't come up with a lot of the new technologies, but he was the person that saw the potential. Um, he saw the potential to actually kind of um, bring it all together and, and make a business out of it that was going to meet the needs of customers. And I guess that the kind of the, the similar, um, you know, today we might look around and we might look at um, Jeff Bezos, for example, at Amazon. Again, not developing the technologies, but he's the person that could see the how do we bring all these things together to really revolutionise um, the retail sector in our case. So I think we do have a lot to learn from history, 
Um, and that's 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 kind of why we're, we're doing this kind of call. But the other thing is about the, the kind of international perspective. And when we were out doing our interviews, people were talking about um, other countries. You know, so I heard people saying, well, we talk all about Industry 4, but in Japan, they talk about Society 5. Now, they're still talking about the revolution of digital and, and how it's going to change things. But their starting point is much more about how is it going to change society? And then they work back from that. So we we're thinking more about the technologies and pushing them out. They're thinking them more about how do we want our society to look and, and how do we um, how do we pull that forward? And then if you look at um, you know other parts of the world, if you look at, at, at Sweden, for example, very much looking at the kind of ecosystem and that enables the technologies to, to be adopted and to make change. Um, so lots of different countries with different views. And I think it would be really good to understand that. And we were interviewing policymakers, particularly, um, that was something that they were interested in. So I think this kind of call about the historical and the international, um, it's going to be really useful for the Made Smarter community. And I think it's got a chance to make a really big impact as well. Um, so I think that's important. So just kind of going back to my slides, the last couple of points on the, on the black slide, um, you know, when we're looking internationally. So we're interested to hear, you know, Where's the focus? What are people talking about? What technologies are they looking at? Or are they starting with that different standpoint? Like I was talking about Japan, for example. And then we'd be also be interested to say, well, what are the key levers that policymakers are using? You know, what what mechanisms um, are they trying to are you are they using to encourage more uptake of digital technologies within manufacturing? Um, and that might also help the UK to think about where they focus their attention and where they need to make more investments. Um, and as I say, looking at other countries and the kind of their strategies and tactics, but again, understanding that we can't just say, oh, that's the right thing to do because somebody else is doing it, but putting it in context. So for me, I think that this kind of systematic review, it hits a lot of buttons and a lot of the things that people were saying were important. I am absolutely no expert in business history or international business. Um, so I've put forward in that slide why I'm thinking it's important. Um, and again, it's one that nobody, I think, has got all the answers to. It is something that needs a bit of digging around and looking not just at academic literature, but that wider literature. So that was all I really had to say. But when Jan said she'd brought in two speakers that she'd spoken to in her travels, last night I looked at the guest list and said, gosh, who actually has a bit more knowledge than me on these topics? So I'm going to pick on a couple of people that were just I pounced on last night um, and said, do you want to say a few words? So Scott um, happens to be my own institution. Scott Cunningham is um, a professor of, of policy. He does a lot in that kind of technology space. Um, so I said to Scott, you're more knowledgeable than me. Is there anything you would like to add about why you think this is an important topic and how it can help made smarter? And I, I'm not expecting him to have slides like, uh, like Matt and Chris. I'm just expecting them maybe to say a few words and then I'm going to pick on somebody else. So, <laughs> Scott, are you unmuted? Here I am. Thank you, Jillian. So I think there's two very exciting topics for for us. Just this very instant, uh, a car alarm goes off in the background and I'm sorry about that. <laughs> just that instant. It's not Anyhow, too bad, Scott. That's good. Two, two, there's two very exciting things for for systematic review reviews here, like Julian uh, said. One is history, um, and, the, and the other one is internationalism. So I'm going to make as a shorthand, just for our, our brief discussion here, about time and place. And I'm going to give you a, a discussion of why I find the time theme so exciting and why I find the place theme so exciting. So let me go back to that provocative uh, comment uh, about history uh, that Julian gave where she said, so too few of us know what those four previous revolutions actually were. So there are many historians of technology and many economists of technology that talk about long waves of change. According to this story, which I personally believe, there's about a 50 or 60 year punctuation in our economic and our technological lives uh, that, that people call Schumpeterian uh, waves of technology. And the funny thing about that time frame is that that's long enough that it's not within our personal life. It's barely within our personal lives that we can say, this is where we are in the cycle. I remember 
the last time this happened. I have to say also that there are that there is questions about this from for other people. We're constantly innovating at all times, at all places, and all things. Um, I don't know. I personally don't know whether that's uh, realistic or not. But but there is also that there is also that quite predominant perspective. So like everything, this is a contested matter. So Schumpeter talks about waves of creative dis uh, destruction in his view of economic life. Uh, we're not at equilibrium. We're constantly reinventing ourselves. And there's a time and a place in history where we root up and destroy what happened in the past in the light of making something better, something something new, regearing the economy, becoming more creative, becoming more competitive. So of course, he's a great Austrian uh, economist, uh, heterodox economist who talks about uh, uh, other perspectives in addition to the, to, to the neoclassical perspective. Part of that story that we've been hearing about for more than 10, maybe 20 years, is about general purpose technologies. When you tear up the economy and you start again, there's something that underpins it. Um, in the past, we talked about things like oil and rail and cars and chemicals. It's very possible that manufacturing, if it wasn't already a general purpose technology, it now will be. Many things will use that manufacturing mindset and that manufacturing life cycle. So this is um, extremely interesting for the manufacturing industry. And most specifically, when we look at manufacturers, we have to recognize from a time perspective that there is a life cycle, that companies are born and they, they grow and some decline and disappear and other ones are created. But during that life cycle, companies have different properties. They have different sorts of behaviors. They're innovative according to their natural lives, just like we as people do different things in different stages of our lives. Some, sometimes we're extremely productive. Other types of our life, we've got other things that we're doing. We're growing or, 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 or we're sustaining. It's the same thing with companies. So there is a life cycle in that whole history uh, where companies, just like the rest of the economy, gear up for productivity or innovate in preparation for growing and sustaining themselves. So this history of this time perspective to recognize where we are in that cycle and specifically to tailor things for the life cycle of new emerging and sustaining firms is an extremely important uh, concept. So that would ask you for us in Britain, what is the needs of our enterprises? Where are we now in this life cycle? Um, even that is questionable. Uh, I think that we're in the spring. I think we've just come out of the winter and we're in the spring of a new uh, time uh, and that we're headed towards uh, it, it, that we're headed towards a new summer of prosperity, growth and sustaining companies. Uh, but that's a critical question. And where are we in that life cycle and what do companies need given their time in their given their time in that life cycle is is a very important idea for discussion. Another part of that is the research and development angle of this. So uh, the government has an extremely important role in research and development and industry has a very important role and they work together to provide a complete package of research and development activities. The question is, you know, if we could have just in time research, just like we have re just in time manufacturing and logistics, uh, government, industry, academia could work together to deliver exactly the research that was needed just when it was needed. Um, Unfortunately, that doesn't happen for good reasons or bad. It just it just doesn't happen. Uh, some people think that research and development is shelved for a little bit of time, uh, maybe even for decades, that it sits on the shelf until companies are, are, are and capital investment is now ready to restart the economy, to rear to, to gear it again. But regardless, that's another very interesting angle. What were the things that have been learned in the last 20 years that could be used to power up the economy? And can we have a proactive strategy for research so that we can give today what we didn't shelve in preparation in the last 20 or 30 years? So with that, I'd like to move onwards to talk about place. I think place is just as exciting as the time theme. So internationalization. Um, but let's also think about place in terms of regions. A lot of people we see two angles. We talk about countries and national systems innovation. We also think about regional innovation systems. So that example of regions as a regions as a manufacturing plant shows you that 
there are cohesive strategies just for designing regions and regions can lead their country or they can be part of a world economy just like the nation is. So let me give you the other story, the story that I don't agree with, but one that you will hear. The story is that the world is flat. Internationalization is prevalent. Everyone participates in every time with the economy. Uh, if that's true, it's not true yet. If that's desirable, uh, it's not what we have. So there are geographies of technology. Those of us who study the geography of technology really examine why. And I have to say, I came into, uh, I kind of lean on or borrow or read with enthusiasm the field of geography of technology. And I had this idea, you know, I can consume my iPhone and, and uh, personal computers and cars and not worry about who produced it and who manufactured it. But when you actually look at who leads in the manufacturing area of these technologies, they have a very specific place. And that asks you the next question of why? Why do those places do it? Why can't everyone have that? Wouldn't it be nice if everyone could produce or manufacture any, everyone that wanted to? But it just doesn't work like that. The facts are today, uh, uh, a smaller number of regions in the world are participating in manufacturing high technology goods. I was just talking, this is extremely um, pertinent to, to Great Britain, I was just talking to the Connected Places Catapult uh, just this week, uh, and one of their quarter one initiatives is to describe the, the taxonomies of British um, innovative districts, British innovative regions. Um, so we know that many of us are very interested in characterizing uh, British regions and thinking about what they're good at and uniquely identifying their capabilities so that we can collectively build a, uh, an effective strategy. But some places are more innovative than others. Um, in the United States, uh, we can think about, people don't think about, we've already mentioned Silicon Valley today. Uh, I don't think, I would personally not think about New York as being an innovative place, but it really is. Over the long haul of history, it continuously produces more patents and innovation and more R&D uh, than other places. It's always on, it's always producing uh, technology. It may not be at the lead, but it never quite diminishes. So the question is why? Why do why do, why the Silicon Valleys? Why the why the San Jose, California, the San Francisco's, the uh, the New York cities? Uh, why not other regions? Um, I was talking to um, a group of uh, government um, uh, government uh, attendees uh, last week about uh, one example, which is Knoxville, Tennessee. You look at that. See, didn't you think, okay, that's just, that's not anywhere. But this has, this district in the United States has the world, one of the world's largest manufacturing plants uh, uh, with tenants of, the, of, uh, of Japanese manufacturing. Uh, they've got Vanderbilt University. They're thinking about hashed health, meaning Bitcoin plus e-health. And they're really trying hard to, to, to propel themselves forward to the future to be a really a competitive place. And you think, wow, that's a really compelling story. Um, Never mind the fact that they also have the Grand Opry House. That's a that's a that's a uh, a music industry. They've got their own little music industry running there on the Columbia River in in Tennessee. So why can't they be a world capital of manufacturing? What are they doing right, or what aren't they doing right? To give you another example, you can go to the southwest of France to the city of Lyon. Uh, beautiful light. Uh, I did so just on a vacation and I stopped by a hotel and in that hotel they still remember the Lumiere brothers. So these are the early founders of film. They got their pictures, they got their artifacts of what they were doing at the time. And that place, Lyon, imagined that it was going to be the future of the world uh, film industry. Uh, they had the early technology. It's almost hard to imagine why they wouldn't be. Why wouldn't France? Mediterranean France be the home of world film. I mean, we still have got the Cannes Film Festival, but time passed them by. Um, I mean, the Lumiere brothers are great examples of history, a proud example of French innovation, but time, let's be honest, time passed them by. It doesn't make an economic impact on that district in a way uh, that Los Angeles does. So here's an example. Before there was a Silicon Valley, there was a Los Angeles. That is a immense 
uh, patenting part of the world as well. I had no idea that Los Angeles was an innovative place. I would just dismiss it and say, okay, yeah, you know, that's just Hollywood films. Why is that innovation? But that's a high tech capital. And that high tech capital got leapfrogged once again by long before there was a Silicon Valley, there was a Los Angeles. So what happened? Lyon, first bid. Los Angeles, yeah, we're gonna be more innovative. San Jose, we can do you one better still. So through successive ways of change and competition, those those districts turned on and, and became excellent in their particular fields of activity. So the idea would be, of course, let's copy that. Let's, uh, Leon, why can't you be Los Angeles? Los Angeles, why can't you be uh, San Francisco? Why can't you be San Jose? But uh, that's really difficult to do so. History teaches us, uh, geography of places teach us that there is one way to fail Forget something critical, one of the many critical things, inventors, uh, R&D, uh, venture capitalism. You know, you miss any one of those ingredients and you're bound to fail. But there's many ways to succeed. It's very difficult to copy each other, but there's a frontier of possibilities. So that leads us to think about competitive factors in strategic management. What are the assets of this region, of our regions, that enable us to compete? Not because we can lift up necessarily a Japanese example, but we can pick and customize and adapt the things that are working for Japan or uh, Shenzhen, China, or uh, the, 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 the Ruhrgebiet the, the, of, of Germany. We can pick and we can copy and adapt those to our local circumstances and cobble together a solution that's contextual and appropriate for our particular regions. So, in summary, um, I told you about time. Uh, I talked about the span of time and the growth and the evolution of companies. And the really burning question of where we are in that cycle. Is there a cycle? I think so. But if so, where are we in that cycle? What do we learn from the last time in history when we were regearing the economy in this phase or season of growth? I talked about place. I talked about why we had to be fully aware of what was happening in other regions in the world, but not just copy it. We needed to adapt it and to make it contextually appropriate. And then you've also got the time and place together uh, about successive waves of change, uh, uh, of innovation that, that spread and diffuse throughout the world. So both these questions together are extremely compelling. Uh, here in Glasgow, we see two or three of those, at least, two or three of those past waves of change. Now the question is, how do we build on that? I heard that a premise from one of our uh, Scottish leaders saying that in Scotland, and I think in Britain as well, we are constantly reinventing ourselves in a way that the rest of the world hasn't necessarily experienced these waves of change. We have the history of doing it. We can build on it and we can adapt to it. So the big finish here is to talk about um, design and context um, to think about the essential strategies for regions and to build uh, roadmaps based on what we've learned about uh, history um, and, and about inter international internationalization. So um, thank you for thanking you for, for having me uh, today, everyone. Thank you for inviting me, Jill. This is a topic uh, uh, I, I think is really fascinating. Thanks so Thanks. much. And and amazing that you've you you you'd put something together when I really just nobbled you yesterday, Scott. So <laughs> brilliant and some really nice uh, some really nice takeaways there. So the other person that I I, I emailed last night and said, you know far more about this than I do, Simon. <laughs> Simon Mullen. <laughs> and Simon um, leads the the business history and international business um, groups at at York uh, at York University. Simon, we've only got a few minutes. Don't feel you've got to say too much, but anything you want to add about why this is an important topic? Yeah, th thanks, Joe. Um, yeah, I think I'll, I'll say, I'll, I'll be brief. I'll say, I think, three things as to sort of why history. Um, I, the, the three points I want to make are first that business and economic history, business history and economic history, I should say, are largely untapped reservoirs of existing academic knowledge, which can be applied, I think, to answer some of the questions that your project is interested in. Um, secondly, I think history allows an exploration of cause and effect over time, and there are lessons from the past that we can learn from that. And the third thing I'll, I'll briefly comment on 
is that history is very accessible because it's a narrative social science and is inherently comprehensible to people. Before I just mention those three things briefly, I'll just make a more general point that, you know, history is a kind of, a, it's a method. It's a, it's a, it has fields of business and management history, economic history, um, that ask us, that enable us to ask critical questions in ways which perhaps other disciplines and areas can do in their own way, but there are things about history which are unique. Um, in particular, the history is interested in both continuity and change. So, you know, what stays the same and, and what changes and it allows us to ask, you know, cr critical questions. In, I think things like, for example, to, to give a quick example, you know, how, how revolutionary are revolutions? You know, how revolutionary was the industrial revolution, so-called? How, how revolutionary are, are changes? There's this concept in, in history of the shock of the old that actually that, that tends to be a sense in which people in the present discount the extent to which the past had radical departures from the pre-existing situation. We should perhaps overemphasize changes in the present and that, that, you know, history can act as a corrective to those, those biases. And so I was just sort of thinking about, to give some examples of those, that in the past, things like refrigeration transformed um, supply chains for business, which transformed the ability of households to store food, which had implications for, in particular, for women entering the workplace. The internal combustion engine was a radical technological departure from the previous situation of energy and, and, and transport that was possible. Um, uh, the, the introduction of birth control radically tr transformed the ability of women to enter the, the workforce. Um, air conditioning opened up huge sections of the world to both manufacturing and services where previously they hadn't been possible. You know, you only have to go to Las Vegas to see that you couldn't have built a city built on casinos without air conditioning to keep people cool while they were gambling in the same way that the transformation of uh, motor manufacturing in the US where it moved to some extent moved from the north in Detroit to the to the, to the, the sun belt sort of states in the south of the US is also kind of connected to air conditioning which enables the factories and the people in them to to operate where previously it wouldn't, it wouldn't have been possible. So the, 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 we, we've seen, history has a lot of these kind of radical discontinuities but also has a lot of continuity as well and, and history allows an exploration of both of those those things. So to my three main points, which I'll be reasonably brief about, business economic history is a very, very large field that's existed for decades. It's empirically very rich. Uh, and as a consequence, you know, I think it, you know, there are there is a sense in which now that, that it is being used as a resource to inform policy making, to inform policy within an organizational context as well. But there's an awful lot of research there that can be tapped. And so I think that, you know, the, the the themes that business and economic history has dealt with around sectoral development innovation, technological adaptation, industrialization and deindustrialization. These are all kind of, there's, there's a rich literature there which can be accessed through systematic review, which can help reveal patterns um, and inform lessons which will be of use to policymakers and, and to, to organizational actors. And I think that's very important. History can also, business and economic history also deals very well with the impact of events that have a disruptive effect on pre-existing patterns which have, which which had which had existed, um, and in that sense as well, can there can be a lot of you know, organizational learning around that, and 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 useful kind of um, useful insights for for policymakers. So I think there's this this sense in which the field is very large, and now is a good moment to be able to say actually there's all this research out there, empirically rich research. That's, you know, if we can bring it together, that can be funneled and channeled in a way that's useful to 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 your project and to for policymakers in particular. The second thing I want to say is that you know, history allows exploration of cause and effect over time, and in particular it allows us to explore what worked and what didn't work. It allows us to see the legacies of, of, of changes, and allows us to see sometimes also the negative impacts of things. Um, you know, if we, you look at the textile industry in, in Yorkshire, for example, it's, you know, the broadly the county that I'm located in here in, in North Yorkshire, if you look at West Yorkshire's textile industry, you know, deindustrialization essentially wiped that away from an employment point of view, but it didn't wipe it away from a manufacturing point of view. There are still textile manufacturing companies in those areas. There's those traditional centers of Bradford, Halifax, Huddersfield, and so on, but they're not they're not employing large numbers of people. So there's, there's questions that we can answer around the likely disruptive effects of new technologies, sectoral changes, the international shift of, uh, of, of, of focuses of ec economic activity, which history can uh, can can shed light on, and in that sense, we can learn from the past. It's an, it's an important thing that humans do anyway. But by systematically going through the literature, hopefully, we can get to a point of uh, more accurate, I suppose, or more insightful 
um, um, understandings of, of how that happened, but also from an international comparative perspective, we can see these, I think as the previous speaker mentioned, we can kind of get an insight into why certain countries, certain regions within certain countries have continued to prosper. And if you look at the agglomeration economies of the Italian industrial districts or the, 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 the renaissance in manufacturing in the Basque country in Spain, you know, the, the, these are the, the important lessons for understanding why some areas have deindustrialized, why some areas have, have 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 shifted the nature of their manufacturing production, on on, on why some areas uh, have prospered and others haven't. And then the third thing is is that history for policymakers, for for lay users, is I think an accessible form of knowledge because it's narrative, because it tells stories. I know your project has a storytelling dimension to it, but that the cases that would be, you know, that you can draw upon in history are, I think, inherently understandable to a non-specialist. You can tell a story about how a business or an industrial sector or a town or a city experienced economic life over time. And from that, it sort of, it becomes a kind of comprehensible narrative, um, which means that it's accessible. And I think it needs to be accessed more. I think there's this case for being accessed more by, by individuals, policymakers and so on, because there are lessons to be drawn, but they're not so specialist that they you know the language isn't so specialist the the narrative isn't so specialist that those those things aren't accessible to people who aren't experts in the field themselves so uh that that's i think that's pretty much all i wanted to say with you i think there are really good opportunities here um to open up uh, new ways of understanding i think uh, drawing mm -hmm. upon a field which i think hasn't particularly been drawn upon as much as it might have been you know, from a um, from a sort of from a sort of policy perspective previously. So it's it's I think the project's very exciting from that point of view. And That's thank great, you Simon. For letting me speak to. Thank you very much. And I knew I could count on you to make it accessible. You gave some really clear examples there that that people like me that don't come from a history background could understand. So thank you. Thank you very much. So with that, I'm going to um, hand over to Angela, who's going to tell us more about the specifics of the call, which is probably what most people are interested in. Angela. Okay, <clears throat> so let's just summarise the purpose of the systematic reviews. As part of the development of Interact, it became evident that there was a broad range of existing studies and bodies of information that relate to the adoption of industrial digital technologies from a number of perspectives. These studies can be fragmented and may present findings in different formats having conflicting views or represent a particular geography of time period. So the purpose of the systematic reviews, it was recognised that there was an opportunity to provide some underpinning reference studies that could provide a bedrock of knowledge for academic and industrial communities, to provide a coherent summary of the established knowledge from both academia and practice on the application and potential benefits of IDTs in the manufacturing settings. The outputs of the reviews should provide a solid foundation for the future research direction. Now for round one of the systematic reviews, the areas to address are what can we learn from historical and or international perspectives on industrial development and evolution that Jill has explained. The second area would be what impact will be the changing nature of business cases have in enabling the adoption of industrial digital technologies. Now the full cost of a single project can be up to £60,000 and this will be funded at 80% of the costs in line with standard ESRC rules. The timetable for events The call opens today um, and then we have a follow up question and answer section on Friday the 4th of February at 1.30. The closing date and time for applications is Tuesday the 1st of March and a funding decision will be made on the 16th of March and successful applicants will be informed. Systematic reviews may then start from Tuesday the 3rd of May and it's anticipated that these will run for about four months, ending at the end of August. Just submit your application 
The application form can be downloaded from the website and then you can submit these with two short CVs um, to the website uh, info at interact-hub.uk. The closing time and date for applications is Tuesday the 1st of March. If you have any further inquiries after this uh, call, then you can join the question and answer briefing session on the 4th of February, starting at 1.30. And details of this will be published on our meeting um, mailing list and available on social media. Uh, alternatively, please email us at info at interact .hub .org, sorry. So now that uh, this presentation is finished, uh, you can connect and start interacting. Please do join our website at www.interact.hub.org or follow us on Twitter or like us on LinkedIn. That's great. Thank you, Angela. And I think what we've now got is a chance for some Q&A. If anyone's got any questions about the topics, about the call, about the funding, anything at all to do with Interact, then um, we're happy as a team to take your questions. And um, if you, you'd like to either post them in chat or you want to put up your hand or just speak out, we're fairly open to all forms of interaction. Question here for you, Jill, um, regarding your comment about which Harvard professor would say that. I was hoping nobody would notice that one, Will. <laughs> I honestly don't know. I did actually, when somebody when somebody gave me that quote, I did go and look it up, and it was there was a Harvard paper that talked about um, why study business history, um, and it was somebody from, it was a Harvard paper, that's all I can see. Maybe Simon or, or Scott can help me out with that. Thank you. <laughs> um, I suppose a question then back to people here, you know, um, is there, are these calls that you think you may be able to respond to? Maybe if I put yes and no in chat, you could perhaps just vote like a thumbs up or thumbs down. And then um, if I was to ask you again, maybe if I was to say, are you more interested in business cases? or um, industry, I'm just going to call it industry four for now, um, to save um, which is uh, which of the topics of more interest to you. Um, again, you might just vote against them. And I suppose um, I just want to say a few words to say, these studies could be really definitive. For any of you that have done a systematic lit review that's then been published, Academically, these can be incredibly highly cited and sort of career defining papers. This is an opportunity to get funding to do a study that could really help to propel your academic career. But at the same time, we want to provide, we'd like you to also provide in your proposal some ideas for how you may then turn that into something that's useful by our end users, you know, the manufacturers, the industrial digital technology providers and policymakers. And we will give you support to do that through our impact manager session. So in a way, you'll have two outputs from this. Hopefully, you'll have the work that leads to an amazing academic paper that could be career defining for you in terms of citations and the like. But also what you can then show is the impact of that work because you'll have developed, whether it be a video, um, a diagnostic tool, a report, a podcast series, whatever it might be in terms of the impact side of things, you'll have those two outputs. And I think this is very much in the spirit of what we would like to achieve with Interact. Yeah. I think we're also think, slightly... Sorry, yeah. I'll go Jill. I was just, just going to say, Jan, I agree. And I think, the, I think the potential for impact is huge, you know, for actually making an impact on, on business and policy is, is really big. We want to maximise that. So there's a question which is a really good question. It's going to be more calls to follow. Um, yes, um, we haven't developed uh, and discussed all of our funding rules about balance of our portfolio, but we certainly wouldn't prohibit people from applying for multiple grants because actually this is about the best ideas. Though 
obviously what we're trying to do is to really amplify our reach and get out to all those parts of the economic and social sciences. We sort of like to think of ourselves, whilst we, we might like a, a tipple that's gin, we sort of thought about ourselves in the early days as being a bit more like Heineken, you know, reaching those parts that other beers haven't reached. Uh, so we really want to get out there and get those views and perspectives that are the ones that we've really not considered. And um, Chris Courtney, our challenge director, I, I think really the measure that he, if we keep coming up with the same people and the same voices, we'll get disappointed face. I think Chris gets most excited when we introduce him to a different perspective or a different voice or a different way of looking at things. And so that's very much um, what we want to achieve through Interact. But yes, you can apply for multiple calls. Yeah. And I think um, the other thing that's really important is that we really do want to support the development of early career re researchers. Um, I was internally potentially caused being ageist, so we don't want to be the opposite either and penalise more experienced academics. Ideally, we'd like to see um, the more um, experienced academics mentoring the early career researchers so that we actually form a partnership we see new collaborations form that would be our dream um but we're non-discriminatory but we'd like to encourage as broader participation as possible and as collaboratively as possible yeah Call, calls coming out in the future as i say um next month we'll be launching the early career um grants which are very very small grants um really just to help people engage more like travel money um and then is it march so if, 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 what's the impact? When's the impact one coming out, Sasha? Um, the impact uh, calls are more about research that's already been done, but how can we make it more useful and impactful? Um, so that's that's in the next few months anyway. And then we've got a big open call, the start of June, um, I think that's going to be launched. And that's where we're really just putting a call out from all disciplines, um, a very open call. Somebody's asked a question about um, the actual nature of the systematic reviews. I don't think we're going to be prescriptive here. I think we're, we're leaving that up to you. Um, it's such a wide, you know, the two topics are so big. Um, I think you've got to decide what's the question you're trying to answer with your systematic review and then tell us how you're going to um, approach it. Jan and I think that, you know, from what we see, it's not all just about the absolute academic literature. It probably is um, involving some of the grey literature and, and things like podcasts as well. Um, but it's up to you how you how you tackle that. Yeah. And so um, actually the results, the scenarios for 2035 started as an SLR. We looked at over 604 thousand different hundred thousand different resources got down to 108 however 60 percent of those papers were what we call gray literature they were um ngo reports government reports uh, world health organization reports consultancy reports that was augmented because sometimes in certain fields some of the thought leadership ideas can lead on the actual sort of academic studies so actually, we welcome studies that are trying to look at all of the sources out there. We've also um, seen that quite often different LEPs or different regions in the UK do the same study, and then they're sort of seen to be competing studies. Um, and actually quite often, so if I think about my own region, you've got the Midlands engine, but then you've got the West Midlands, you've got the East Midlands, you've got the Black Country. And so you, you could sometimes see papers like, you know, what's more definitive, a, a Midlands engine view or a black country view and actually part of the reason for these reviews is to not start a debate by almost having a battle of whose paper is most definitive but to actually start the debate from here's the evidence base this is where people agree this is where there's areas perhaps of of difference there's a question or a comment about um papers in different languages um actually maybe the way of bringing in new voices is to bring in voices that are actually in a different language but maybe you should put into your bid some money for translation because if they are really good papers maybe part of what this is about is making those really good papers um that are perhaps written in japanese so therefore not necessarily <laughs> something that we can all read actually more easily accessible by people uh, that are um english speaking so i think you can be creative and what the funds are and i think these are meant to be definitive studies. We've called them systematic reviews. Obviously, you know that I think ideally, I think the goal should be to publish them academically as well as to create something that's highly impactful. So I think we'd like to see methodol methodological rigour, but also creativity. Um, and we're open to ideas. 
I think somebody's also asked about collaboration and yeah, we would welcome collaboration that um, I'm not sure how best to do this, whether perhaps the Q&A session next week is maybe a way if you're if you're still looking for a, for a partner to work with, that might be a place to, to come. If, if I might just add right at the end here, um, just I'd really like to encourage everyone, as you say, just connect up with Start Interacting. We've just launched our New Look website. All of the information on the funding calls is going to be on there. We do have social media presence, but we are very much at the start of developing this network. So any ability you have to share it with your own network, people you think will be interesting, is really useful to us and hopefully to them as well. And likewise, if you think that there's content out there that either you produced or someone you know has produced, there's going to be relevant to people in this network I welcome you to send it over and we'll be able to share that on your behalf as well. That's a good point. Um, well, uh, you know, the, the LinkedIn um, page is probably a good way if you are trying to find partners to start conversations. Yeah, and we are, a, we want to be a network of networks. And so um, your, our nodes into our, your nodes in our network, please create more nodes by then sharing with your networks. And then we really get that um, networked effect. Um, but please, please do um, sign up so that you're formally part of Interact and then we can make sure that you're on the mailing list, not just in regards to this call, but also to any of our further calls. So, and is that the best place to join that through the website, Will? Yeah, I'll just post the link in the chat now. If you go to our website, it's very clear where you need to go to do that. Yeah. And can I just say a final thank you to our speakers um, on my side, especially to Scott and to Simon, who were just asked at the very last minute, did a fantastic job. Thanks very much, guys. And also to, to Matt and Chris um, for something that you've had to prepare. So I appreciate the effort. Yeah. And so I think we're just about to give you five minutes of your lives back, which is fantastic. I think you can see the enthusiasm that Jill, I and the team have for this really, really important topic. We are incredibly um, honoured to be part of the Made Smarter family. And I think we are really, really quite chuffed that we have this ESRC investment in this area and this topic. Um, it's not all about us. Actually, our measures are really about creating that um, that ecosystem and about growing the network. And we really do want to hear those new voices and see those new perspectives. So we really encourage you to consider this call and to stay in touch through the network and to look out for our further calls and for our whole range of networking events that we'll be running over the coming years too. And thank you very much for your time today. We appreciate how precious it is.